Hi everyone, welcome to Unit 7, Chapter 3, where we will be discussing the digestive system and the excretion or the urinary system. So before we start talking about digestion, we need to talk about nutrition. In order for your digestion to be efficient and get you the nutrients that you need, you have to be feeding your digestive system the proper nutrients. Um, one link that I have here is choosemyplate.gov. When I was learning about nutrition, we were all about the food pyramid and grains would be on the bottom. And then we would have like vegetables and meats and things like that. But now we don't teach it that way anymore. It's more important to have a well-balanced, rounded diet. So now we use the round plate. Uh, if you would like to, you can view choosemyplate.gov and explore the different uh, recommendations for nutrition by the United States government. But in the meantime, let's just talk about it. So first, you're going to need vitamins, minerals, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats in order to balance your homeostasis or it maintaining a uh, your body's equilibrium state. So vitamins. Uh, vitamin A is really great for your skin. In fact, lots of women use this to uh, as anti-aging. If you've ever heard of retinol or tretinoin, that is vitamin A, but vitamin A can also cause birth defects, so people should not use it if they are pregnant. Vitamin D is produced by your skin when it is exposed to the sun, so getting lots of sunlight is really great. Vitamin D helps your body absorb calcium, maintaining strong bones, but it also helps with depression, which is why in higher altitudes, or I'm sorry, higher um, latitudes, that uh, people will use sun tanning beds during winter months when there's not as much sunlight available to them so that they don't get depressed. Uh, vitamin E is found in a lot of lotions for your skin. Vitamin K is really interesting. Vitamin K is given to every baby born in the United States no matter what, because some babies are vitamin K deficient and cannot clot their blood, so when they are born, they have bleeding problems. Not all babies suffer from this deficiency, but we give all babies the intervention because it's much safer to give the medication to everyone than to risk a baby bleeding to death. We also have vitamin B and C. Vitamin B is really great for energy. In fact, lots of people will take it for weight loss and energy as they start working out. It gives them a little boost. But vitamin C, the deficiency in vitamin C is sometimes called scurvy. And vitamin C is citric acid. This is really important for your skin. If you don't have enough vitamin C, your skin will start to kind of um, become damaged. It can't repair itself as easily. Uh, so the cure for scurvy is, lo and behold, a well-balanced diet, making sure that you get plenty of fruits. Um, so discovering that vitamin C is found in citrus fruits was revolutionary for the health of sailors. We also need minerals to maintain our bodies. We need calcium and phosphorus for our bone health. So we need both of those for our bones, but that's not the only place that we need them. For instance, calcium is in very important for muscle contraction. And so if you don't have enough calcium, your body will steal it from your bones, leading to osteoporosis. Sodium and chlorine can be found in sodium chloride or table salt. Uh, in fact, sodium can be found in almost all foods, but we need sodium and uh, chlorine. We need chlorine for our stomach acid, but we need sodium for nerve transmission or signaling of transmissions using those electrolytes. Uh, potassium and magnesium can also be found uh, just in a variety of foods. Uh, potassium is most famously uh, known for being found in bananas, but that's not the only place to find it. Uh, we also need iodine. Iodine is put artificially in salt, but it's found naturally in most seafood. So if you don't have a high seafood diet, you might use iodized salt to help replace the iodine that your body loses. Uh, you need iodine for your thyroid. And you also need iron. As we mentioned a couple weeks ago, iron is really important for hemoglobin. So without iron, you're not going to be able to breathe. Also proteins. Now, a little bit of a good thing can go a long way. You don't need too much protein. 
too much protein can really overload your kidneys and you don't want that, but you do need proteins. In fact, there are 20 different amino acids and um, you can't make all of them in your own body. We can make eight of these amino acids, I'm sorry, we can make all of these amino acids except for eight. And so those eight you need to get from your diet. Now, if you eat anything like meat, fish, dairy, uh, eggs, those products all have complete uh, amino acids. So they have all of the essential amino acids that you need. But in order to replace the protein in your body and make new protein, you're going to have to get those eight from your diet. If you eat meat, that's great. But if you're a vegetarian, it might be a little bit harder for you to get all of the nutrients that you need or all of the amino acids that you need. So one thing that vegetarians do is they eat lots of legumes, lots of beans and lentils. Legumes are a great source of protein. They have valine, threonine, uh, phenylthalene, not phenylthalene, phenylalanine, uh, leucine, isoleucine, tryptophan, um, and lysine. So all of these different amino acids are available in beans except for methionine. Now, remember from biology one, methionine is your start codon. So you need methionine for not just some proteins in your body, every single protein in your body is gonna start with methionine and you can't get it from legumes. So you have to get it from grains. Uh, corn and wheat, uh, grains like that have methionine in it. So you do need a variety in your diet of both grains, legumes, um, and meat and dairy if you um, can't get it any other way. Children who are growing also need arginine and they will need to get arginine from their diet. Uh, carbohydrates are another important part of a balanced diet. Uh, you get all of your energy from these sugars. Uh, no matter whether we're talking about starch or, you know, a, a piece of bread, a sandwich bread, it's still going to have sugar in it. These carbohydrates are large, long branched chains of sugar. Uh, so monosaccharides are single sugars. And if you remember from biology one, glucose is your body's basic unit of sugar that it uses. It has one, two, three, four, five, five, six carbons arranged in a ring structure. Okay, one of the carbons is sitting out like that. Um, and this is a monosaccharide because it only has one ring. Uh, we're talking about glucose, but also fructose. Fructose also has six carbons, uh, but again, um, a couple of them are hanging off the edges here. A uh, disaccharide is going to have two sugar rings, such as lactose, which is found in milk, and sucrose, which is found in most every processed sugar uh, food that we eat. Sucrose is made of glucose and fructose uh, joined together, whereas lactose is made of galactose and glucose joined together. But if we get much larger than that, we call it a polysaccharide. Um, which is a long branch chain of glucose. Now plants will start, uh, will store their glucose as starch, normally as amylose, these really long chains of glucose, but also amylopectin. Um, amylopectin is found in the cell wall and it acts as kind of a glue and it has all of these branches. Humans and other animals, however, will store their excess glucose as glycogen, which is a highly branched chain. Now, glycogen and glucose go through a metabolic process in your body to help maintain homeostasis. One thing about human bodies is that our, when we eat, the uh, the food that we eat is directly dissolved into your blood. So if you ate a high sugar diet, you're going to have a large spike in blood sugar after you eat. Now, normally this is not a bad thing because your pancreas will produce insulin and the insulin will transition that glucose or the excess glucose into glycogen to be stored. In your, uh, the insulin will also allow your body cells to absorb the sugar so that you can use it as energy. If you don't produce insulin, then that blood, that glucose just stays in your blood and it can cause uh, problems. 
Now, if you don't have enough glucose, then your body will release glucagon and glucagon breaks down glycogen back into glucose in the bloodstream where your body cells can absorb it. So these two things work in opposition of each other to help maintain homeostasis to make sure that your blood sugar doesn't get too high and then it doesn't get too low and then it stays within that level. We also need fats in our diet. The scientific name for fat is a lipid and a, a single unit of a lipid looks like this. This is a long fatty acid chain. Um, if you remember biology one, there are two main types of fats that we consume. One is called saturated, which means it is saturated with hydrogen. They are uh, straight chains, meaning there's no double bonds. So they stack very easily and are solid at room temperature like butter. Oil, however, is liquid at room temperature because it is not saturated with hydrogen. Some of those hydrogens are replaced by double bonds, which can cause kinking in the long chain. The kinking does not allow them to stack, and so they remain liquid at room temperature. These are unsaturated fats. Uh, fiber is also very important, even though it's not one of the main nutritional groups that we went over earlier. Um, humans actually cannot digest fiber, but it's still important for the health of your gut and allowing um, your body to properly digest and uh, absorb the nutrients that it is consuming. Also, you have microflora in your digestive system that can break down these fibers. Um, that is called fermentation. Now, some animals do the fermentation in the front part of their digestive system, but you and I, we do the fermentation in the back part of our digestive system. And this uh, fermentation allows us to further absorb nutrients that we wouldn't normally be able to absorb, especially vitamins. So what kind of digestive tracts can help absorb these nutrients? Well, there are two main categories of digestive tracts, incomplete versus complete. Incomplete digestive tracts has a single opening, the mouth anus. So anything that goes in and anything that goes out of these organisms will go out the same opening. These organisms have what's known as a gastrovascular cavity, a cavity or a hollow opening inside the organism that allows it to transfer nutrients. It will be using this to absorb oxygen and nutrients from its food because they maintain a very simple, thin body plan that allows for simple diffusion to take place. More complicated organisms, however, have something called a complete digestive tract where they have a separate mouth from their anus, uh, allowing their food to go through their body, kind of a tube within a tube type body plan. Um, earthworms have an even more uh, uh, complete digestive system as opposed to this very simple one that is essentially just a mouth, an intestine, and an anus. Um, we now have a pharynx and a crop and a gizzard, which is the first time that we see really uh, more convoluted tubules here for the digestive system. The human digestive tract is much more complicated than that of your earthworm. Uh, we have a mouth, stomach, pancreas, a small intestine, a large intestine, a liver, and a gallbladder. And all of these organs work together to make sure that we have nutrients within our body. Now digestion is going to take, uh, is going to begin in the mouth. Not just a mechanical breakdown, but chemical breakdown of the food as well, because the salivary glands in your mouth will release amylase. Now I wanna go back and look at this page right here. Amylase. Amylase sounds very similar to this word amylose. So amylase is an enzyme that is going to break down amylose. So carbohydrates begin breaking down in the mouth as the food is being chewed. Next, you will swallow your food and peristalsis, which is a rhythmic contraction of your smooth muscles, will begin to push the food through your digestive system. 
When you chew your food, you create what's known as a bolus or a small little packet of food. And your esophagus's job is to push that food all the way down into your stomach. Now, I don't know about you, but I used to think that my esophagus pushed food from my mouth to right about here, but your stomach is actually below your diaphragm uh, right there. So your esophagus goes all the way from your mouth through down your throat, through your chest cavity to your stomach, which is underneath the diaphragm into the stomach. Now, the stomach is a very muscular organ. It does a couple different things. Um, it's going to further mechanically break down your food. In your mouth, you have teeth and strong chewing muscles to help you mechanically break down your food. In your stomach, you have deep ridges and layers of musculature along the outside of the stomach to help grind and kind of massage the food further into a paste. Your stomach is also going to produce hydrolytic enzymes like pepsin. Pepsin helps to break down peptides or proteins. So while your mouth is digesting uh, sugars or carbohydrates with amylase, your stomach will be digesting proteins with pepsin. You're also going to be producing gastric juices or acids. It's hydrochloric acid, which is a very, very strong acid, is produced by these gastric glands. But don't worry, you produce plenty of mucus to protect your stomach from these digestive enzymes and acids. Next, your food is going to be dumped into the small intestine, particularly the first little section of the small intestine called the duodenum. Now, the small intestine is really important for absorbing nutrients. Whereas the stomach really broke down a lot of these nutrients, the small intestine is there for absorption and um, also to produce some further enzymes to help break down more peptides and more sugars. Um, you're also going to be adding things like chyme into this section. First, let's talk about it absor the absorptive power of the small intestine. The small intestine is also very muscular to help with peristalsis. So peristalsis is continuing in the small intestine. And we also have deep folds and ridges. But unlike the stomach, the deep folds and ridges are not there to agitate the food. The deep folds and ridges are there to increase the surface area of the small intestine. And on those deep folds and ridges are something called villi, which are little projections of the stomach lining. Inside the stomach lining is the um, blood vessels which are going to run capillaries right underneath the surface of the lining to help absorb as much from your food as possible. So there can't be many cell layers in between the capillary and the intestinal lining because we want diffusion to take place over that short area. So even further on top of the villi are the epithelial cells and on top of the epithelial cells are something called microvilli. Now these are very different than cilia cilia actually have small um, uh, proteins inside of them that help to flick side to side to move mucus around. The microvilli are not there to move around the mucus, but are there to absorb nutrients from the liquid inside the small intestine. And again, that helps with diffusion. Now, during inside of the duodenum, we have several different bile ducts that are going to be dumping different enzymes into the small intestine at the very beginning at the duodenum. One of them is the uh, pancreatic duct that is going to help pancreatic juices be dumped into the small intestine. The pancreas is going to produce um, amylase and more trypsin, not, uh, not more, but uh, more uh, enzymes to break down proteins. So trypsin and pepsin are both going to break down peptides. Uh, and then we're also going to produce lipase, which is going to break down lipids or fatty acids. Now, that's not the only thing that's going to be released into the duodenum. We also have the common bile duct or the common hepatic duct that's going to connect the gallbladder to the duodenum. Now, the gallbladder is just a holding tank for bile. The bile is actually produced by the liver. So the liver produces the bile, which is stored in the gallbladder, 
and when it's needed, it is dumped into the duodenum to help further break down fat. Um, after the small intestine, the um, now mixed chyme liquid and nutrient fluid is dumped into the large intestine. Now, the large intestine has four main parts, beginning with the cecum. Now, in humans, the cecum is rather small. This isn't a large organ, it's just a small pocket of the large intestine. It is hypothesized that the cecum helps to ferment our food and helps us to absorb um, vitamins and nutrients uh, by letting those uh, bacteria help ferment our food. So in that way, we are hind gut fermenters with our small cecum. Attached to the cecum is the appendix. The, you don't need your appendix to live, but the hypothesis is that it houses lots and lots of good bacteria to help feed the cecum. If the cecum ever runs out of bacteria or the bacteria get sick, there's more located in the appendix. Now, the appendix can get inflamed if that bacteria overgrows or is taken over by a pathogenic bacteria. Um, in that case, you would drain or remove the appendix and you live a normal, healthy life without it. Um, other than that, you have three main parts to your large intestine. You have the ascending colon, the transverse colon, and the descending colon that work. Um, well, let's look at this picture. Here we go. The ascending colon, transverse colon, and descending colon that will then go into the rectum, which holds feces um, while you're waiting to go to the bathroom um, that can then be pushed out of the anus. Now, the job of the colon, this very large um, intestine, is to reabsorb a lot of the water because we don't want to become dehydrated by releasing too much water in our feces. So besides the cecum fermenting our food, this uh, large intestine's job is to reabsorb lots of water. Now, if we reabsorb too much water, it can lead to constipation or hardened feces. If we don't remove enough water, then it can lead to diarrhea, which is a great segue into talking about laxatives. What if you do become constipated? Well, there's two main kinds of laxatives that you could uh, take. First one being a stimulant laxative. Remember that your digestion is being driven by peristalsis or the muscle movement of your intestines. So if you're having trouble moving food through your intestines, you can take a stimulant laxative, which will aid in peristalsis. Now, if you have hardened feces in your intestines and you're stimulating uh, peristalsis, this can be very painful and also not very effective if you're not also drinking enough water to soften that stool. So your other option is an osmotic laxative. An osmotic laxative works by pushing lots and lots of solutes into your large intestine that cannot cross this barrier. So it can't be absorbed by your blood. So we have lots and lots of solutes. Well, as we remember from biology one, if we have lots of solutes on one side of a membrane and not a lot of solutes on the other side of the membrane, water is going to be pushing its way into this uh, cavity in this case, your large intestine. If you have lots and lots of water being pushed into your large intestine, it's gonna lead to diarrhea, which leads me to Hybero sugar-free gummy bears. If you ever get the opportunity, just read some of these Amazon reviews about these gummy bears. This one in particular, I found very dramatic and striking. So sugar-free gummy bears are a very powerful osmotic laxatives. Just take this as a cautionary tale. Don't eat more than the recommended dose because you can give yourself uh, osmotic diarrhea. All right, this is an overview of the digestive system of humans. If you want to uh, review every single enzyme that is released at every single point in the digestive system, um, this is your go-to diagram. Uh, let's talk about some other types of digestive systems though. Most animals, as we discussed, were monogastric, meaning they have one stomach. Um, humans are monogastric, but also other animals like rabbits are monogastric. Now, looking and comparing these two, I see one 
major, major difference, which is the cecum. While humans have a very small cecum, rabbits have this very large cecum, and that allows rabbits to eat things like grass, which normally don't have a high nutritional content because we can't digest the cellulose that's made that grass is made of, but the bacteria housed in the cecum can digest that cellulose, and so then we can absorb the nutrients from the bacteria, which is what rabbits do with their extra large cecum. Another thing that rabbits do is they eat their own poop. Now, not call, to call this poop, these are called cecotrophs, and a rabbit with a large cecum will produce these cecotrophs. These are partially digestive little nuggets of nutrients, still have a high water content, still have high nutrient content. So what the a rabbit will do is they will re-eat the cecotrophs until they have absorbed all the water and nutrients from it and the poop looks like this. So don't too quickly take the feces out of your pet rabbit's cage because they may not be done with it yet. Other animals, such as birds, have a digastric system. I'm not sure if that is a, a real term. I haven't seen it pop up anywhere else. But what they have is actually two different chambers of their digestive system. The first chamber is the crop, and it's more like a pocket where food can be stored. And then food is transferred to the gizzard through the proventriculus. Now the proventriculus is what is uh, producing all of these digestive uh, juices and enzymes and stomach acid, but there's no actual stomach here. Instead, the food moves through the proventriculus, picking up all of those enzymes and going into the gizzard. Now the gizzard is a pocket, a very muscular pocket where birds will consume small pebbles or grains of sand and the, pro, uh, the gizzard helps to um, mix the food with all of the enzymes from the protriculus, proventriculus and uh, further mechanically digest the food by grinding it together. They still have a liver and pancreas that dumps into the small intestine. And then when we get to the end, we have a cloaca. Humans do not have a cloaca, but actually marsupial mammals do. This is just a single opening that includes the opening to their urinary tract and their digestive tract and their reproductive tract. So there's only one outside opening, but they still do have all three different tracts. Now you notice that this animal does not have a large intestine or a very, a very large intestine, has a very small large intestine, and it doesn't have a very large cecum because its diet does not require those kinds of things and birds do not reabsorb a lot of the water. They'd rather be lightweight and get rid of that water. Now, how come this pocket is ahead of the gizzard? Well, uh, birds can kind of move this food back and forth as they need to um, and feed their young using food that was hidden in this crop. Um, ruminants have actually four stomachs, so instead of being monogastric or bigastric, they're, they have four stomachs, so I guess tetragastric. Now, four, it's not four separate stomachs like four of these type stomachs, it is more of a chambered stomach, and the stomach is huge, it usually takes up the entire body cavity. Um, ruminants are called that because they ruminate on their food or they chew cud. So when they first eat the grass, they're going to swallow it and it's going to hang out in the rumen, hence ruminants. Um, and the food will just kind of sit there or the grass will sit there and start to decay. Um, if it's broken down into small enough pieces, it can make its way into the reticulum, but what the animal is going to be doing is regurgitating, chewing, and re-swallowing this food until it is small enough to make its way into the omassum and the abomassum, that fourth chamber. Um, so all of these chambers work together to ferment this uh, grassy diet before it gets into the small intestine. So they're very efficient. The things that we could not absorb in our digestive system, they're going to be able to absorb in, in this digestive system because they have such a long small intestine and such a large chambered stomach that allows for fermentation before the small intestine instead of fermentation after. In this case, this is called a for gut fermenter instead of a hindgut fermenter like our rabbit. 
Now, like I mentioned, these uh, or organs are huge, um, especially the rumen, which is going to take up most of the space. Here you can see a diagram of a cow and the rumen takes up almost their entire body cavity um, before it even makes it into the reticulum or the omasum. Um, the omasum and the abomasum are really concerned with um, absorbing uh, liquid or absorbing, yes, absorbing liquid before it goes into the other parts of the intestines. Now, these are not the only kinds of digestive systems. They're just the only ones that we're gonna go over in detail. For instance, an animal that doesn't eat any grass isn't going to need a cecum at all. Um, so this insectivore shrew is going to not have a, um, a cecum and it, it just has a very long, small intestine and large intestine, no cecum visible. Um, a carnivore does have a small cecum, even though they eat mostly meat. There may be an ancestor in their lineage that ate berries or even bears are omnivores um, and will eat some grains and berries. So they do have a small cecum, but not a very large, large one like you see with the cow. I'm sorry, like you see with the rabbit. Um, also, interestingly enough, Platypuses do not have a stomach at all. Their esophagus dumps straight into their duodenum. So the food that they eat is going straight into their small intestine. But this is probably due to their high, uh, uh, highly basic diet. They're going to eat lots of uh, snails and crustaceans that have lots of calcium carbonate in their shells and this can neutralize stomach acid. So I'm not sure if they would gain very much from adding a bunch of stomach acid into their digestive system because it would be completely neutralized by the food that they eat. So they're better off just producing enzymes instead of producing the stomach acid. Next, we need to talk about osmoregulation. Osmoregulation is the process of maintaining your water balance within your body. So think about us being terrestrial animals. We have to consume all of the water that our body needs. We can't just absorb it from our environment. And once we do have that water, we have to hold on to it so that we don't lose too much water. Um, Animals use various methods to maintain their water balance or maintain homeostasis. The simplest of which is of course, just plain diffusion. Uh, animals like jellies uh, have very thin tissues allowing for simple diffusion. Another uh, version is going to be exocytosis and endocytosis. So very small unicellular organisms can utilize that. Other organisms have more complicated methods of maintaining homeostasis and maintaining water balance. Um, if an organism lives in a hypertonic environment, kind of like the marine environment, there's going to be much more salt outside of the body than inside. So they run the risk of losing too much water. So those organisms are going to have to use these uh, methods to maintain as much water as possible. If an organism lives in a hypotonic solution, kind of like a freshwater lake, there's going to be more salt inside the animal than outside. So they run the risk of getting too much water. The osmotic pressure will be pushing into their body and we don't want them to swell and explode. So that organism is going to have to do a lot of work to get rid of excess water. Some organisms are actually isotonic to their environment, meaning that they have the same water content as the environment around them. And so they're able to maintain homeostasis just by being at equilibrium with the environment. So how do these different animals do it? Well, one method is the flame cells in planarians. Uh, the digestive system of a planarian, as we have gone through, is an incomplete digestive system with one single opening, but their nitrogenous waste can be filtered through these flame cells. So any large particulate waste is going to have to leave through the mouth anus, but uh, suspended nitrogenous waste can be uh, diffused through these cells outside into their environment. 
uh, the flame cell looks like this and it's called a flame cell because it has tons and tons of little cilia in here that flick back and forth creating a little bit of a vacuum to pull liquids out of the digestive system and then diffuse it out into the environment. Um, the insects actually use something called malpighian tubules. These are small tubules that are attached to the digestive system of the insect. So insects have very simple digestive systems and they have no closed circulatory system. Their circulatory system is open. So their lymph or their hemolymph, their body fluid, is just open in their body cavity. So these malpighian tubules are little uh, extensions that go into the body cavity with lots of surface area to absorb as much nitrogenous waste as possible and then cycle it back into the digestive system so that it can be uh, disposed of. So that's another simple method using diffusion. Now, once we talk about earthworms, earthworms are much more complicated and they have a closed uh, circulatory system, meaning that they have capillaries. So they have something called nephridia or a nephritic tubule. This nephridia is very similar to the human nephron, which is part of our kidneys. It is a series of tubules that go back and forth across the capillary network to absorb as much nitrogenous waste as possible and then dump it outside the body. Now, uh, as far as osmoregulation uh, is concerned, we have two different categories. We have osmoregulators and osmoconformers. For instance, an osmoregulator is going to be using lots and lots of energy just to maintain their internal homeostasis. So they're much less tolerant for a, a large change in their internal environment, but they're much more tolerant for a change outside of their internal environment. So this elephant, for instance, is a terrestrial animal, which means it is a true osmoregulator. They have to consume the liquid in their body and maintain it internally, which means no matter what's going on in the external environment, the external environment can change wildly from one extreme to the other. The internal environment of this elephant is going to remain constant at the same level constantly. Um, so they're very unbothered by changes in the environment, unless, of course, it gets so extreme that they can't survive. For instance, if you dropped this elephant in an Arctic tundra, it probably wouldn't do too well. But uh, small changes in the environment are great because they have such control over their regulatory systems. Now, this is very expensive as opposed to an osmoconformer, which pretty much relies on its external environment um, to maintain its internal environment. So if we go up in osmolarity externally, we're gonna go up in osmolarity internally, leading to a perfect uh, incline. So a perfect one-to-one -one ratio, such as this jellyfish. Now, uh, we have a whole variety of organisms that sometimes semi-osmoregulate um, and only have a slight uh, curve to their um, osmoregulatory line, I guess. Um, but they, these organisms are going to be restricted to warmer environments that meet their conforming needs. So they can't be in an area that's too salty or not salty enough, that's too hot or not warm enough. They're going to have to live in these specific zones. But this process happens naturally and doesn't require any ATP. So it's a lot cheaper to be an osmoconformer. Now, uh, if we're talking about invertebrates, most invertebrates are osmoconformers, like the jellyfish that we mentioned. Um, they're not going to do very much work to maintain their internal homeostasis. Instead, they're just going to rely on the environment outside. Vertebrates, however, are mostly osmoregulators. Um, cartilaginous fish like sharks and rays actually make their own body isotonic to the environment. So sharks and rays are isotonic, but I call them semi-regulators instead of true osmoregulators or true osmoconformers. I would put them on this median line because they do have to do a lot of work to make sure that their internal osmo uh, 
osmolarity is similar to their external osmolarity. They do this by retaining urea. So when their um, kidneys uh, clean their blood or filter out their blood, they're going to reabsorb a lot of uric acid or urea in their blood, raising the osmolarity of their blood um, so that they are isotonic with the seawater. And this is true of sharks, rays, and skates. Bony fish, however, and even terrestrial animals are osmoregulators. They have to adjust their salt and water levels in order to uh, survive. Now, if we're talking about fish, generally marine fish can only live in a salt environment and freshwater fish can only live in a freshwater environment. Occasionally, however, some animals can do both, like salmon who have a life cycle in the marine environment and a life cycle in the freshwater environment. Um, so again, if we're talking about a marine environment, we're talking about high levels of salt um, and other solutes. So these fish are going to be having to battle the water loss, whereas freshwater environments have very low level of salt and they have to uh, battle having excess water pushed into their body by osmotic pressure. So let's take these two fish for instance. This is a freshwater water telost, teleost. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that word, but this freshwater fish. A freshwater fish is going to be consuming food and then filtering out a lot of um, or filtering oxygen from their gills, but while they're filtering oxygen from their gills, their gills have a special uh, thing called the sodium potassium pump. So everybody has sodium and potassium in their body and sodium is in the water as well. So the sodium potassium pump in the gills of the freshwater fish will be actively taking in sodium. Okay, we're actively taking in sodium. Then this same fish is going to be urinating lots and lots and lots of dilute urine to try to get rid of excess water because the water is working hard to push its way into the fish due to diffusion or osmotic pressure. So the fish has to combat that by absorbing extra salt and urinating extra water. The marine fish, however, is opposite of that. When they eat food, they're going to be taking in lots of seawater. Yes, they will be taking in lots of sodium that way, but they're also taking in lots of uh, water. Their gills function the same way for diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide, but these gills, the sodium potassium pump is actually facing the opposite direction. So we're gonna be getting rid of a lot of sodium and keeping a lot of potassium. So we're getting rid of a lot of sodium. And then diffusion is actually going to try to pull water out of the fish. So the fish has to regulate this by urinating very, very little water. So their urine is going to be extremely concentrated. Terrestrial animals um, don't have either of those challenges. We just don't have an aqueous environment. So our water loss is happening through our breath, through our skin, through sweating, um, and just evaporation. So we need to drink and retain that water from our diet. So our food and our, our liquids that we consume have to contain enough water. And we have a specific excretory system to help maintain the water balance inside of our body. These terrestrial animals, for instance, like the Sonoran Desert Kangaroo Rat, actually doesn't drink any liquid as an adult. Past uh, drinking milk as a pup, these animals get plenty of water from their diet. Even though their, their diet is made of dry seeds, there's something called metabolic water. Now, if you remember from Biology 1, when we went over the electron transport chain, we talked about what do, what do we do with these extra hydrogens? Well, the extra hydrogens are popped on to the oxygen to create metabolic water. Normally, this is just a byproduct, but it's really helpful for the Sonoran Desert Kangaroo Rat because that's all the water this organism will have. Camels do the same exact thing. They also use metabolic water, but they live um, 
also in a harsh desert environment, their metabolic water is mainly going to come from the fat that's stored in their humps. Yes, their humps are used for storage of um, nutrients, energy, and things like that, but mainly water. So their fat stores store energy as well as burning that fat produces extra metabolic water. Now camels have another mechanism to help them maintain water balance, and that is that their internal environment can change wildly. Whereas osmoregulators um, they will uh, maintain their internal environment due to their external environment. Camels can have extremely liquidy blood or extremely thick blood, depending on how much water is dissolved in their blood. Um, they can drink about 20 gallons of water at a time at the higher extreme of the or the higher extreme. Um, but not all of that water is used immediately. It diffuses into the blood, diluting the blood and just kind of staying there until the organ, until the animal needs that water. All right, nitrogenous waste. All animals have to produce waste as a byproduct of their metabolism. Um, this is due to the breakdown of amino acids. And so we end up with lots of ammonia or nitrogen. So here we've got a nitrogen and a nitrogen. We've got two nitrogen here. We wanna get rid of as much nitrogen as possible. Terrestrial animals use something called urea. And that means that they're gonna to have to drink a lot of water, but they're not gonna be losing very much water because urea is more efficient. Um, birds are even more efficient and they use uric acid, which holds even more nitrogen. And so they lose even less water when they urinate. So here we have several different kinds of animals. Um, most fish just urinate straight ammonia. It only has one nitrogen, um, so it's not extremely efficient, but it is really easy and they live in an aqueous environment so they can just consume more water very easily. Um, mammals are going to be using urea, which as we mentioned before has two nitrogens, um, but it uses a little bit more water. Now, birds and reptiles use uric acid, which has one, two, three, four nitrogens, which is way more concentrated than mammals. So more nitrogens means less water loss. All right, let's talk about the humans. Now, we are uric, uh, urea excreting animals, so we're going to be creating urea in our um, uh, urinary system in our kidneys. Our kidney is a bean shaped organ and we have two of them on either side of the body. They are connected directly to the aortic uh, or to the aorta. So the renal uh, artery comes directly off of the aorta to uh, go into the kidney. And then once the blood has been uh, filtered and the waste removed, the blood will go back out through the renal vein into the inferior vena cava to go back to the heart. On top of each kidney is an adrenal gland uh, that excretes adrenaline and norepinephrine. And then the urine that's produced from the blood is dumped into the ureter, which is then stored in the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder is connected to the urethra, and the urethra is um, much longer in males than females. A uh, female urethra is very small, and it's also wider, meaning that females generally uh, suffer from UTIs a lot more frequently than males do. Now let's look at these kidneys and what the kidneys are made of. Um, there's going to be the um, uh, outer region of the kidney here, and the first couple centimeters of the kidney, we can call the cortex. So this area right here is the cortex. Underneath the cortex is the medulla. Now the cortex and the medulla have different osmolarity or different osmotic pressures. And this becomes important later on. But just keep in mind that the cortex has a different osmolarity than the medulla, which is the inside area. Inside of the medulla are these little packets of nephrons called pyramids. So this is a renal pyramid and it is a, a packed full of nephrons. This is a nephron. We'll get to this in just a second. 
Um, the nephron will go above the medulla and below the medulla several times um, to increase the concentration of the urea being produced. And then the nephron will dump into the renal pelvis, which is this funnel shaped thing here. These are calyx, which is just an extension of the renal pelvis that funnels down into the ureter, which then connects to your urinary bladder. Now, like I mentioned, the pyramid is made up of bundles of these nephrons. The nephron is the smallest functional unit of the kidney. This is what's actually filtering the blood. And it does this by passing tubules into the medulla and into the cortex uh, several times. So what we have beginning with the um, renal artery is a small capillary that's all twisted in this area called the glomerulus. Now this is primarily driven by blood pressure, but remember this is coming directly off of the aorta, directly from the heart, so lots and lots of blood pressure. The pressure is pushing onto this glomerulus, which pushes a uh, waste into the Bowman's capsule, which is just a little like house around the glomerulus. So we're catching all of this waste and we're funneling it into the first part of the nephron called the proximal tubule. Uh, proximal means close. So this is proximal to the Bowman's capsule or proximal close to the Bowman's capsule. So we go, uh, the waste will flow through the proximal tubule down past all of these capillaries. When it's passing the capillaries, the waste is being passed back and forth from the capillary to the tubule. So the waste is going into the tubule and um, we're going down the loop of Henle where the uh, tubule gets very, very thin. So lots of transmission is happening here. We're going to be absorbing a lot of water as well and we don't necessarily want that. So on the way back up, we're going to be removing some of that water because remember the medulla has a different osmolarity than the uh, cortex does. Now, once we get back up over the top, we are now in the distal tubule. Distal means far, it's far away from the Bowman's capsule. And then we're going to dump all of that urea into the collecting duct. And other nephrons are also going to be dumping uh, their urea into the collecting duct. At this time, your hormones such as ADH or vasopressin will determine how much water needs to be released into the collecting duct. So you're going to be producing highly concentrated urea waste up here, and then you will be dumping more water into the collecting duct if you are uh, have excess water to get rid of. If you don't have excess water to get rid of, then you do not do that. All right, here's another image. Um, these are just for review because we've already gone over all of the steps. If we break down the steps, there's really only three main things happening. Filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. And here we have step-by-step step each thing that's happening in these different tubules. So we are going to filter out all of the waste. Then we're going to reabsorb the water and then reabsorb some salts because we don't wanna get rid of everything. Okay, now we have highly concentrated urea. We can either remove more water or dump more water into the collecting duct. Um, glomerular filtration is obviously going to happen in the glomerulus, and then reabsorption is going to happen throughout the rest of this journey. We're going to be exchanging uh, water and different excretions. All right, this is also just for review. We can see the water exchange here, um, how we are going to be removing some of the water from the urea back into the blood here as well as here. But remember in the collecting duct, this is determined by vasopressin um, or your other hormones that determine whether you're uh, going to lose or gain water. Um, in the uh, ascending tubule, we're also uh, adding or removing some salts because we don't want to remove too much salt. 
If you would like to view everything all together in one smooth animation, I welcome you to come back and look at this video, um, but I'm not going to play it. Uh, you can come back and play it if you are interested in watching the animation. Um, so we have to maintain our blood volume and blood pressure in order for the kidneys to work properly. And this is done with the help of different hormones, such as the one we already mentioned, vasopressin, but also ANP or atrial natriuretic peptide. Okay, natriuretic peptide. These two work in opposition of each other. So they are opposite of each other, where ADH will help you reabsorb water you're not gonna be urinating as much with vasopressin. If you release NA, a ANP, you're going to be releasing water. So you're going to be urinating a lot more. So ADH reduces your uh, water urine and ANP increases the water in your urine. Um, pH is adjusted also by the absorption or release of bicarbonate ions, which we know are basic. Um, secreting hydrogen ions would increase the acidity. Here is an overview of the hormonal control. Um, but again, most of what I would like to discuss is ADH and ANP. If you know that ADH and ANP work opposite of each other, um, then we're super happy. There's also the renin system or angiotensin system, which helps to control and regulate uh, the blood pressure. All right, some things that can go wrong. I included this because lots of students are curious about it. What about kidney stones? Um, kidney stones are hard uh, deposits of minerals that stick together, usually in the renal pelvis. Um, so usually right here is where they get stuck. Um, men have a much harder time with this again because their urethra is much narrower and longer. So this can be very, very painful for both men and women, but especially for men. Um, these different calcifications or different mineral deposits can be um, from different minerals, but the main one is calcium. M the majority of kidney stones are going to be from excess calcium, um, but there's other kinds like uric acid stones. If you're producing uric acid on accident, because we're supposed to be producing urea, um, uric acid can be a byproduct and is indicative of gout. Um, let's see. Last but not least, I wanted to talk a little bit about dialysis. Dialysis is basically an artificial kidney or an artificial nephron. What we're going to be doing is pulling blood from our patient and cycling it right next to a clean dialysite or a dialysis fluid or washing fluid. So it's not washing fluid like soap. It is a clear or osmotically pressured fluid where any solutes in the blood are going to naturally want to move into this uh, dialysis fluid because there's less solutes in it. So even distilled water would work. Um, it might work too well though. We don't want to lose everything in our blood. So it is a specific fluid for dialysis. Um, but all of the solutes in your blood will naturally want to move over to the fresh, clean fluid. And so this only works if we constantly flush it with fresh, clean fluid. Um, so refreshing in, uh, this fluid is important. We're also going to be cycling the blood through. Um, so new blood, new fluid until this osmotic uh, pressure stops. Um, Patients who undergo frequent dialysis can have something called a, a, a fistula, um, which is an opening from one or uh, from one organ into another. And we do this by grafting because the pressure is really high uh, when we go through dialysis. And so the pressure can be so great that the vein can't handle it. And there's so much blood volume that it can't go into the capillaries of the hand. So we give it a nice little area um, that the artery or the artery can cross over and supplement the blood that's in this vein. So we do have some mixing of blood here, but that's okay um, because it's gonna go back to the heart. You know, we're going from an artery to a vein, not from a vein to an artery. 
Um, and this helps to uh, prevent too much pressure because that pressure can lead to widening of the vein. So this is somebody's vein. Um, so much pressure in that vein causes it to increase in size and muscle, like, like more muscle and connective tissue will be built around this to be able to support all of the pressure from the dialysis. So again, we have to have fresh dialysizing fluid um, and any used dialysis fluid will be flushed out as new blood is constantly flushed through a semi-permeable membrane, allowing diffusion to take place. Um, as always, don't forget we have a laboratory write-up this week. If you uh, download this copy and scan the QR code, you will view a video of the interactive lab. There is optional homework if you would like to do the optional homework for extra credit, uh, similar to the guided notes. But absolutely don't forget that there is a chapter quiz, usually due Friday at 5 p.m., um, and this is in Blackboard, so please don't forget to take your Blackboard quiz. There are other study aids available, such as the textbook, uh, vocabulary cards, coloring, or even vocabulary-based games. Y'all have a wonderful week, and I will see you next week for the 